Hi again, this is Zach from Dirty Sexy Words with more talk about sexy books because uh, sexy books are always an interesting thing. Um, this time I'm going to chat to you a bit about uh, the old days of sexy books and the fact that there was a lot of erotic fiction being written and bought and read a long time before that book we won't mention and it's legion of ropey imitators who um okay we don't need to talk about that there is cracking good fem sub fiction out there het fem sub stuff there's loads of it if you want it and a lot of it is infinitely better than that one is but there was a lot going on before that one came out there really was um being a veteran pervert, as somebody put it, old lag is another way of putting it. I remember a lot of the stuff that was going on a long time before Bad Twilight fanfic. And I thought I'd talk you through some of the things I remember, some of the things that influenced me, some of the stuff that might have influenced your own filthy fantasies, or indeed the things you got up to and are going to get up to in the future. Um, I think... There was always an un... well, there was always a kind of simmering underground of rude books, rude stories. Uh, Olympia Press was one of the sort of historic ones, and it disappeared. And there was an Olympia Press based on the Isle of Wight in the 80s and 90s. I haven't heard anything of them for a while. If you're still out there, say hi. Might want to stock some books. Um, they tended to, at the time, favour plain coloured covers, often yellow or turquoise, with just lettering on or occasionally line drawings. And what they put out was hardcore kinky stuff. Um, a lot of it was in Dubcon territory. Some of it was a little bit on the dubious side, but it was mainly, you know, hot BDSM, spanky, sexy fantasy fiction, few holds barred. The biggest of the mainstream publishers in the beginning was Nexus, which started life, I think, as an independent and was later taken over by Virgin Press sometime in the 90s. Now, the Nexus books, those of you who used to travel long distance on motorways in the late 80s, early 90s, you probably saw some of this sort of thing kicking around, a little stand in the corner um, next to the fags and sweets and so on would have a whole range of these. They published a lot of titles. The first one I ever picked up, I think, was in about 1991, and it was called The Girl From Page Three, and it was a silly bit of nonsense, but it had a lot of bonking in it. Um, can't remember the author's name. Again, if you're out there, hello. Um, and it was it was quite basic stuff, but it was properly spelt and edited and so on. And um, Nexus were doing steadily and quite nicely with this huge array i think there were four titles a month or something maybe even more of naughty books and in the mid 90s they kind of got a bit dirtier the 90s there was quite a bit of change going on in the 90s in terms of what you could and couldn't do um a lot of it being around the explosion of smutty stuff for the girls um which is a whole other topic that is i could go on about that at length and will one day when we're all back to normal again you can come buy me a pint and ask me all about it but one of the things that um nexus now now was owned by Ebre press or virgin or somebody like that they diversified into a range of by women for women titles which were called uh, the range was called black lace that launched in 1993 with a lot of fuss and there was a lot of whinging about, oh, women don't want grubby porn, as always, and but, oh, women did. Now, there was some pretty generic stuff in that range as well, but there was also some cracking good stuff. Another thing that was going on in the mid-90s, and this is where I start getting my sticky paws involved in the mix, was um, a magazine called Erotic Stories. If you were around from about 93 to about 96, you might have seen something like this on the top shelf of the newsagent, along with Penthouse and Razzle and all the rest of those generally rather straight vanilla-ish magazines that did show you a bit of muff, but not much more than that. And you never got to see 
stiff dicks and you rarely got to see seriously open leg stuff either. Now these mags were short stories, they were text based, they had come out of Forum magazine which I know a lot of you remember but um, erotic stories was the all fiction arm of Forum magazine for a while and then it went independent and it introduced quite a lot of the people whose erotic fiction you might read today. Uh, Penny Birch, Lindsay Gordon, um, Christina Lloyd and quite a lot of the others because we, we had an international following. We used to get stories from the States and so on and lots of people, sometimes uh, me and the former editor Joanna Payne get together over a couple of gins and it's like, we gave them all their beginnings. And it, this magazine was kind of a part of erotic fiction history. When um, that book came out, we were all having a bit of a laugh about it. So if we got that sent into her, she you know, smacked her bottom and sent her home and at least told her how to spell it properly. But um, yeah, these would be collections. You would get about 10 to 15 different short stories with illustrations um, as everything at that publishing house tended to be done on the smallest budget possible. Um, uh, there isn't a single illustration in that one. We had a bit of a budget so we could get about two stories per issue, properly commissioned illustrations. Otherwise, we liven them up with the standard tit and bum shocks out of the we own all the rights, bought one off photo sets. Generally, the head's cut off so they weren't too identifiable. But yeah, we used to do themed issues. I think this one was a hysterical historicals one. Uh, this one was a general. We had a sci-fi one. We had vampire ones. A um, bit of everything, really. So it was a good range. And it's from that that my own enthusiasm for er anthologies of erotic fiction kind of comes from. Because in an anthology, you spend your money, you've got ten or more short stories. If you get a big, thumping great anthology like a Mammoth or a, or a Hefty Clice Press one, then you could have something like 20 or 30 stories to read through and see what tickles your fancy. Because if you don't like one, skip it, move to the next one, there'll be something better on the next page. Now, as I say, Nexus diversified into Black Lace, and mid-90s there was a real explosion of erotica. It was around the time this magazine was taking off as well. There was Ex Libris, there was Chimera. I've got a Chimera title. I've only got one or two Chimeras in stock. They're a bit harder to get. Uh, the Chimera imprint was all about corporal punishment. Certainly in the 90s, a bit less so now, there were distinct divisions in kink. You were either into S&M or CP. And if you were into S&M, that encompassed your leather rubber tits arse whip, as a employer of mine once described it. Um, there was a lot of fetish dressing and what people might now think of as BDSM and DS, but there was a certain amount of protocol, but not that much. And clothes and fetish wear, rubber and latex and leather and PVC, was as big a factor as DS Dynamics, which was later. But Chimera's imprint was very much on the CP, the corporal punishment element. And corporal punishment had a lot more to do with a different sort of role play. The idea wasn't that getting whacked was just about erotics. It was about disciplining. You would, This is where you get your school uniform fetishists and cane experts and lots of spanking. Now, this imprint, I had a book out with them, which is out of print. You can't find it. Don't go looking because it isn't very good. Um, it was very, very femme subby. Chimera was always femme sub. It was nearly all he femme sub, but they were quite willing to accept a bit of girl on girl femme sub as well a lot of the ideas at the time was that the main market for this stuff was straight cis men despite the fact that people who are not that interested in erotic material often go oh men like pictures women like words that's rubbish as well because everyone can like everything um but it's always been more difficult to get visual stuff for cishet women that appeals to them. More about that another time because again I could go on and on and on and I'm uh, losing my train of thought. So there was a lot of spanking fiction, a lot of your basic Nexus stuff was very spanky. Some some more BDSM, there was whipping, there was restraint, there was some role play but a lot of it 
would focus on this idea of a innocent young lady getting herself into a shocking predicament, which could only be resolved by her dropping her knickers and getting a good hiding, um, which she would, of course, learn to love. We are... Um, <coughs> that's all right. It's a smoker's cough. It's not the plague. When we were running erotic stories, we used to be quite big on the idea that we didn't do dubcon we were partly you know we were in national news agents we had to be a bit more careful than some of the more radical publishers have been in the years since and more careful than some people are now because um we were kind of mainstream and also there was the whole issue of dubcon in erotic fiction stuff where somebody's not consenting to the remarkable things that are happening to them but they like it really it's a tricky one to handle, so if you're not sure, leave it out of your writing. But we also like to keep it as diverse and as high standard as possible. Think outside the box, do things that are different. Uh, Black Lace by Women for Women. They expanded further um, and they had a range called Idol, an imprint called Idol, which was by and for gay guys. They had another one which was by and for uh, gay Girls, a lesbian imprint, which I think was called Sapphire, but it didn't last very long. I don't know if it was if it was because it was too mainstream for its intended audience or we were starting to see changes in the publishing landscape around then because there were changes to come. Yep, the rise of the Internet didn't kill porn altogether or written porn. It did change it. You could get a lot more for free. And uh, there was a lot less, oh, can you do that? It's a bit rude. Then again, Nexus used to do some absolutely filthy stuff. Um, anything by Ashling Morgan or particularly Penny Birch is going to blow your socks off because it is far harder than you think people got away with in the 90s. A later imprint in the UK was Excite, now gone. But they started out with this very distinctive cover style, the pastel pinks and blues and greens. And quite often, not the standard couple embracing. I mean, this one's just got thighs and panties on it, but they were generally sort of obscurish body parts, as opposed to the old school John Dietrich cover style, generally by John Dietrich, who's a good chap and a good photographer. But things were moving on and opening up, and the Excite ranges tended to be broader in their appeal. They had a bit more variety going on in them. And then... Gradually, the publishers mainly kind of faded away in the late noughties. And then they all started to come back again post that book with a variety of ups and downs. And Nexus, and Nexus has gone black lace, I think, is still hanging in by the skin of its teeth, but you don't hear much about them. Excite's gone very quiet. But there are a lot of newer publishers coming out now. There's Kleiss, who are in the US, been going forever. There's Sincere. US based but accepting British writers. Sexy Little Pages is on hold for the time being. Sinful, up and coming newcomer. There is plenty of erotic fiction out there and a rich history of erotic fiction out there, so you never know. Always worth looking out for old books as well as new ones. Till the next time I see you, stay safe, keep those hands clean and your minds dirty. Bye bye. <laughs>